Ladies and gentlemen, on this episode of Spoiler in Time, we will finish by spoiling episode six of season two of Fargo. Uh, then episodes before that, I mean, uh, then if you go backwards through time, Jessica Jones episodes one through four, The Man in the High Castle episode three, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to date. We'll have a brief discussion with our guest, Christy Cates, about that. We will not be spoiling The Leftovers, however. We're saving that for next week because it's just too good. Right, Brian Brushwood? That's what I hear. Also, the fact is I can't keep up with you. You're a machine made of watching other machines. Machines. You're a machine I, watching I machine. I just tape a television to one eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> and then I do all my work with the other eyeball. Yeah, no, I had to make a call. Uh, I did not get caught up on The Walking Dead or on The Leftovers because I knew everybody would be on fire to hear what we thought about Jessica Jones and uh, uh, Man in the High Castle, which we'll talk about. But uh, first, we have to introduce our special guest this Oh, yeah, episode. we mentioned Christy Cates. Christy Cates is here joining us to talk about some of the shows. Thank you for joining us, Christy. Thank you for having me back, guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Shall we stir uh, things uh, about by talking about uh, this week's advancements in the movie draft? It's too late to say no, Tom. You can't say it. Call me no. Tom. Still in first place for now, Merritt. <laughs> oh, still in first place, <laughs> Yes. Uh, so I have cobbled together just enough movie to stay in front of Milango, who hasn't had a movie since Paranormal Activity, so he's not building up anything right now. Uh, the Peanuts movie has done quite well at $99 million. Spectre has done expect expected levels, $154 million. Uh, Goosebumps <laughs> is the number one buy in the movie draft now at $76 million, but... Christy Cates is right there in fourth place, and and it's our first movie, 102 million out of the gate with the Hunger Games. Yeah, Christy, are you happy with uh, with how uh, Hunger Games: Mockingjay Part Two has performed for you so far? Is this what you expected, or are you nervous? Um, I actually expected a little bit more, just because it's the final one in the series, and I kind of thought the final one of anything you would expect tons of people want to go see because it's the final one. But it kind of underperformed. I thought, like I was telling you guys, I went to see it last night. And I was one of maybe 25 people in the theater. And granted, it was a 10 o'clock movie on a Sunday night. Okay, fine. But, you know, still, I'm, I mean, I've got two other movies coming up. It'd be nice if I could get some numbers similar to those. And maybe I'd be, at least I'm not last. That's good. That you, makes you me don't, happy. <laughs> so, somebody from the audience could correct me on this, but I believe in most of the major trilogies, the third one often does the worst. Uh, yeah, I believe and Return so when of you the have Jedi, a fourth one... <laughs> Uh, what, what, well, I mean, okay, yeah, uh, is second I, no, half of the saying, last like, one. Yeah, third one does the worst, and then you stretch it into four. Is that such a good idea? Right. Uh, no, I, 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 th I think you're right. It'll be interesting to see if that uh, has any kind of staying power on there. Um, Tom, you've got. Uh, uh, are you out of juice, or do you expect a lot from the night before? Uh, you know, I'm out of juice. I, I could probably get another 200 million out of out of my remaining movies, uh, combining the night before, which is getting some good buzz. Uh, then Sisters, which will you know get its audience to come in, and who knows what the hell Daddy's Home is going to do. But the the <laughs> three of them together are not going to do more than 200 million, plus maybe a, a, another 25 million or so uh, if you count in what Spectre will still pile up over Thanksgiving. Um, I'm saying they'll do more than 25 million. I'm saying probably amongst what Spectre's got left, what the Peanuts has got left, and my remaining three movies is 250 million. It's not going to be enough to win this. I'll tell you what, though, it is enough that I think it's enough to sh shut out uh, Malengo because Malengo's sitting at 230 million, and uh, he does have the good dinosaur, and Pixar movies yeah. tend to do at He's least 200 million. He's going to get a couple million. hundred million out of that. Correct, correct. But that'll take him to 450, <laughs> maybe 500 million. But I think you're on top. I think you're set, Tom, to blow past 550 million or so. I, I don't know if I'll beat Malengo or not. I might. Um, but yeah, I don't think I'm going to really catch good, Christy I mean, and I don't think I'm going to catch you. Me? Uh, I think it's between you two, uh, between me and Christy. Yeah. Okay. So For Justin, sure. we think is out with $30 million. Uh, he's got Krampus and Alvin and the chipmunks well, he's coming got Creed up this week. <laughs> Uh, and I've got the night before. <laughs> Creed and, is well by the way, reviewed. Christy has Victor Frankenstein this Cre week. Creed as well. is well reviewed, but but I don't see any way it's going to make unprecedented money. It's just got too much competition. Yeah, uh, and of course, Ibit we think is is pretty much spent. Um, and Malengo. Well, he does have three movies late: Joy, The Hateful Eight, and The Revenant. But again, you're talking about a combined 150 million there, so yeah. maybe 200 million there. I, I agree. So I, you know what? I, I'm willing to say it's a three person race at this point. Uh, Tom, Christy, and Brian. Um, uh, speaking of which, let's go to our triage uh, where we have a letter speaking about my chances for uh, for the winter movie draft. You want to read that, Tom? 
Robert says a winter opening movie is no good for box office gross. Well, let me be ironic when I say that because two links to show people definitely watch movies in the winter. They, those are the number one and number two domestic gross movies of all time, and they opened December 18th and 19th, respectively. One of them is a little movie you might know called Titanic. T -t Titanic. T -t -t Titanic. Titanic. Uh, as you know, Star Wars opens the 18th. It will destroy the opening weekend record and have a long tail of repeat moviegoers. Yeah, I got I got to admit um, uh, that that did pop into my head as we read that letter last week or the week before. I forget which one. But um, uh, I agree. I think that uh, I think that uh, 18th or 17th, 19th is a good time to set a record. And I think that's exactly what will happen. All Plus, right. there are going to be people on people on vacation over the holidays that are probably going to go see it more than once. So you're going to get those repeat viewers well and, and that's the Especially thing right that is it's, it's the type of movie that you know for a fact you could take the entire family mm -hmm. to go see and that's exactly what everyone's gonna do there are two things i want to say about star wars the force awakens first if it's good brian wins i don't think that i, I don't think that you could lose if it's good because people will continue to go back it has yeah. so much anticipation around it what if it's bad I don't think Brian wins because I think immediately people just stop going to see it. Uh, and then it has its big opening weekend, but it never builds after that. And, and the, just a big opening weekend wouldn't be enough because that's the only movie he's got. Uh, but I think it probably will be good. And I, I think we did the right thing on the movie draft, which yeah. is we don't know. We're still sitting here going, well, Brian probably is going to win, but it's not locked up. It's not for sure. Dude, we all agree about that, except for Justin Robert Young, who's a big fat pouty <laughs> pants about the whole thing, says it's the draft is invalidated, and he refuses to acknowledge that the winter draft is a legitimate draft. That's fine. That's fine. We'll you see. know, we've all got opinions. They're like elbows. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. There was something. I was like, there's a body part. I can't remember which one. Is it elbow? Yeah, well, it's elbows. Hey, uh, uh, <laughs> why don't you guys spoil the shield for me? Uh, because I, or I'm sorry, uh, the, the agents of the shield. I know, because we miss <laughs> talking about shields on this on this show now. Uh, Christy it's suggested we talk about, uh, talk about agents of shield, uh, Marvel's agents of shield, which both of us are up to date on. And Brian was saying, you know, he kind of bowed out in the first season, which no blame there. Uh, a lot of people did. I stuck with it because it did get better in the second half of the first season. I think second season was rough, kind of got draggy here and there, but I still liked it better than the first half of the first season. And so far this season, I have enjoyed it quite a bit. I think some of their strongest storylines are playing out now. And we got to visit another planet, Christy. That was pretty amazing. And you know what? The acting in that, I, I was really impressed because she kind of did a, you know, the Tom Hanks lost on the island thing for a while there. Did it really well. Yeah, she really had to a act twist. with herself. I, what's that? And she had to act with herself and be tinted sort of purple. That's true. Purple. Yeah. Everyone knows it's much more difficult to act when you're tinted purple. <laughs> That's um, what they tell but me. But that, that was a twist that I really liked was that. And also the whole thing with Professor Garner. I honestly did not see that one coming at all. At all. The whole yeah. Indian Lash thing. Well, and they the one thing I would say about the early season was the twist with Ward uh, at the end was, I did not see coming. Uh, I, I, and so the giving Daisy who we've now gotten used to calling Daisy instead of sky, Finally. uh, <laughs> was, I, I wasn't as shocked about, but that was a nice twist. I did not see this professor coming out. It makes me feel good that I still don't know what's going to happen next, that they're going to be able to surprise me. That's the thing is it keeps changing and twisting so much. And even, I mean, the, the whole Fitzsimmons thing too, I, I'd kind of, I'm trying to avoid reading the stuff before Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. airs, but I'd seen a little spoiler about that. And I thought, oh, something happens with those two. That wasn't even what I expected. And then this yeah. Rosalind character, I don't know what to make of her. One minute I just despise her and I don't trust her. And the next minute I'm kind of feeling sorry for her. And I, so she's another one. This is kind of like a left field thrown in there. I don't know what to make of her. What do you think of her? Yeah, I loved her on Entourage, I'll be honest. <laughs> like I that that actress is great. She was in uh, House of Cards as well. Uh I and so I I want to like her character. I'm cheering for her character to end up being good, but they are doing a fantastic job of leaving it impossible to tell even when you know what she's doing is she doing it for the right reasons or is she doing it to be a double agent? I mean, it's the classic spy thing where she can tell Coulson horrible things that she's going to do because she's like, well, the only reason I'm doing them is because of this. And I, I feel like we kind of got close to resolving that with her when we finally find out, okay, she did not know that that was Hydra. Yeah, that was a thing that made me kind of 
Because yeah, right up to that point, I was just sitting there hating her, and Coulson got her locked into that containment room, and I thought, oh, she's locked in there, and now she, he's got her, and she's done. And then he started telling her, oh, I know you did this and did that, and she, the face she made when he explained to her what was going on, yeah, yeah. and he knew she was doing it, and she made that face, and I thought, oh, okay, she either really didn't know, and she's on the good guy's side, or she's ward part two, and she's a, you know an excellent actress. Her character's an ex- excellent actress, so that and was going to be wait and see what happens there. One of the things I'm most impressed with in the entire series is their ability to change characters. So I totally believe Ward is evil now, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to even partway into season two. I wanted him to be redeemable, and they've gone, nope, he is irredeemable, flat out. And changing Sky into Daisy, I like the way they played with it, where Coulson kept getting her name wrong, (laughs) so that it kind of eased you in as a viewer of like, okay, you can, yes, it's okay to still think of her as Sky, but she's going to be called Daisy now. And I didn't really like calling her Daisy, but now I'm totally used to it. Yeah, and I'm also used to the the Bobby Hunter dynamic. They have kind of like this Hepburn, Cary Grant dynamic thing going on with the banter, and I like their characters too. At first, I, you know, they're kind of like invading the the shield team and who are these new people and then i like them now so yeah they introduce new characters really well in this show and they make each character individually strong and i think that's why i like watching it is because there's a lot of different characters to watch that are pretty realistic and they work well with each other i haven't thought about it as hepburn grant that's awesome oh that's what i meant that totally nails it yeah (laughs) and and that's one of the things i like about that pairing because the same way i didn't like hunter much at all i didn't care less about it i didn't hate him uh and 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 i and palicki i liked from Friday Night Lights. <laughs> so <laughs> I wanted to like her character. Uh, but yeah, they've made them into uh, people that I forgot weren't in the show from the beginning because they're so much a part of the team now. Actually, yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. We have a new one coming up to watch. So Absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's bring Brian <laughs> back in. You sleep? <laughs> Agents of what? Uh, no, Man in the High Castle. Uh, episode three. So we've talked about episodes one and two because we previewed them before. But let's, how are you? How are you feeling uh, on the first of the new episodes? I don't mind if you guys keep talking after I talk, but I'm going to tell you the truth because that's what I do. The third episode was far and away the weakest of the first three. It slowed down. I thought the bad guy was a little bit cartoony. Um, I thought the Owen from Torchwood, you mean? I guess. <laughs> uh, you sure? Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. Chewy McStickerson. <laughs> I'm bad. <laughs> um, the uh, felt a little predictable, felt a little bit cliche. Like, we get it. He's so bad that upon meeting a random character, he pulls a shotgun on him because he can, because he's bad. And we get it. He kills a guy because he's amazing and can recognize him from a deck of cards and then also just to prove how bad he is strings him up but just in case you're wondering how bad he was also insists the villagers let the eyes get plucked out um we get it he's real 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 bad um the novelty of the uh nazi run america is sort of wearing off on me and uh where i'm hoping for more surprises maybe some more intrigue about the chess game between the japanese and the and the uh, uh, the third Reich, um, I'm not, I'm not seeing, and maybe it's all in there. Maybe it all comes up, but for right now, it just felt really, really slow. It felt like a giant pause and, uh, I, I have faith. I'm going to keep on going, but this episode did not really do it for me. Two things to tell you. Uh, one is I'm really glad to hear you say that about the Marshall, because I know that character from the hours and Torchwood and I've even seen him play bad guys. And I thought it was just that I know him as other characters and as British that made me not buy his Western guy act. Uh, and you're telling me, nope, it's just kind of weird. Just just uh, cliche. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it, there was a lot of cliche stuff in here, and I didn't expect that from the show, from something that's been so unprecedented and so clever in so many ways. Uh, it just felt very predictable. I felt everything a beat before that it happened. Here's the other thing to tell you, which is I had the same reaction watching this episode and went right into episode four without stopping, and I'd forgotten I felt that way until you said it just now. Oh, good. Uh, I, I, that, that, that gives me faith because, <laughs> because I'm in it for the long haul, no matter what. Because some of the things that you said you want, I think, and I, I don't want to promise because everybody's perspective is always different, but I think you'll get enough of those things going forward. Well, good. Uh, uh, Christy, you've watched beyond this episode, right? Moving forward. Mm, no, this is the last one I watched. I oh, okay. Watched okay. Before, so, so, so what, what did you think? Um, I mean, I understand kind of why it slowed down because 
after Juliana killed the origami man, she's going to be shocked. She's going to have to have like a recovery period. So I got that for the first maybe 10, 15 minutes. But yeah, the marshal, I don't know. At first I thought, oh God, he's really creepy. And then, you know, the second, third, fourth, fifth time he appeared on the, on the screen, I agree with Brian. He's very cartoony and he's almost too cartoony. And there's almost too many little, he has too many little ticks and little things. Like he's got the hat and he's got the voice and he's got the deck of cards and he's, hey, you know, I, so yeah. That, that kind <laughs> I, of... I also have a pair of leathery <laughs> wings on my back that I yeah. fly around on. <laughs> I'm bad. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah, he was almost too overblown and, and, I'm hoping maybe they'll dial him back a bit, and maybe that would help. But um, I still think the Juliana character is really strong. Joe's strong. I like that we kind of went back to Frank and and saw some of what Frank was going through. Yeah. And- uh, meanwhile, I did feel like uh, the sort of pulling back and forgive me, it's uh, I'm terrible at remembering the names, but our but our our, our uh, SS infiltrator into the resistance uh, that we thought at the end of the second episode when he turns around and you know. Uh, tries to save our main character uh like oh clearly he's in a position but he wants to do good um uh seeing him sort of having his mess his motivations go back to the gray area and especially being vividly reminded that that uh our female protagonist is spoken for back home and that there's not going to be a romance between the two of them and he might be into something that that isn't going to come to fruition i i think all of that 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 was the more engaging part of it for me. And, you know, the set pieces were beautiful and uh, uh, the cinematography, I think, is, is good. Um, it's just that the storytelling uh, was, was a little soft. The acting was solid. The set pieces and the backgrounds and the cinematography were all great. Yeah, you know, in this episode, was interesting particularly, is, um... you don't get a lot of scenery. You don't see a lot of of the of the world around you, which is the strongest part of, of this yeah, entire well, series. Except for except for it does look like as they're exploring inside the Rocky Mountains looking for this cave, it does look like they walk past the same moss covered rock because it was the best moss covered rock they could find. <laughs> as they're exploring, it looks like they walk past it three times. Although if I'm sure I that's not the case. If I tell you where they shot, and you might know this already, but if I tell you the location they shot every pretty much everything in, would that ruin it for you? Uh no. What, was was it Los Angeles? No. Where was it? Seattle and Rosslyn. Oh. And Rosslyn well. is where Northern Exposure was shot. Ah, oh. interesting. Okay. Interesting. So the those beautiful scenes out in the woods and the mountains and stuff are outside of Roslyn, I would assume. I don't know that for sure. But but the 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 uh, neutral zone, which always makes me think of Star Trek every time they say it, I never go. <laughs> uh, the neutral zone is probably all shot in Roslyn, and all the San Francisco stuff is shot in Seattle. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh, that makes sense. I could totally buy that. Um, yeah, it, again, I'm still in for it. It's just the softest of the episodes I've seen so far. I can't wait for you to, to keep going because there's a couple of episodes. And again, I'm biased. I was going to love this. It could have been the stinkiest piece of crap. And I probably still would have found a reason to love it because I love this story so much. Uh, but overall, without being spoilery beyond this episode, uh, I really think Ridley Scott and team – did a good job of doing the same thing to Philip K. Dick's story here that they did to Philip K. Dick's story in Blade Runner, which is pull the pieces out that are really interesting and rearrange them into a cool story and then show you an amazing world. And episode six in particular is the one that just I was freaking out for for a reason not related to the story arc, but but something they did in that world that I thought was a good idea to take advantage of. Well, good. I'm, I'm hopeful about it and, and we'll see. You know what Let's else talk is cool about, about that Jessica. too that I wanted to point out is is just the oh, use sorry, of music I noticed. And I, I kind of maybe because like Brian said, this episode was a little slower, I noticed it a little more. But you know, they're in one of the scenes they were in, they're playing Mr. Sandman, which is from like the early sixties. And I almost feel like they're inserting these kind of overly bubbly songs into this really dark world to kind of remind either us or the character that there was a world before this all happened. There was a world before this takeover in this occupation and it was kind of a clever audio cue way in the background still but i just noticed that and i thought oh i bet that's that was really a purposeful thing to do i think yeah that's really cool that fusion of bubbly optimistic music with a dark destroyed uh, world it has been a hallmark of uh, uh you know we, we saw it in bioshock but it really all traces back to uh, in the late 90s the original fallout was the originator of um uh, Fusing ah. that bubbly music with a dark, despairing, uh, uh, destroyed dystopia. Uh, but, also, uh, but and and I and maybe it's because I'm playing Fallout Four that it was very <laughs> apparent to me that I'm like, oh, they're doing the Fallout thing. 
also pay attention to the artists that they choose. Because they're not you, the original artists? No, no, they are the original artists. Uh, but it, a hallmark of the 50s and 60s uh, would be that a song would get popular by a black performer and then get recorded by a white performer and then become uh, even more popular because, you know, Andy Boone did it or whatever. Or Elvis. Or Pat, Pat Boone. What, what, yeah, no, Pat Boone or Elvis or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, you, you will notice that in this world, you are only going to get those re-recorded uh, white people versions of them for obvious reasons. Huh. I believe it. Interesting. Let's move on to Jessica Jones. Uh, you got through episodes one through four, Brian. Which episodes? do You, do you just got through episode one, right, Christy? One, yep. All right, okay. and, and you don't mind us uh, talking over your experience. Why no. don't you take us? Go what right were your ahead. impressions with episode one? Especially, uh, obviously, there there are strong um, uh, female influences. You know, there, there's parts of the story that are uh, it, we have a female protagonist, which means inherently, you know, uh, uh, we see things through a different lens. Um, what was it like for you? Did anything stand out? Um, I was actually I was looking forward to this quite a bit because Kristen Ritter is a good actress. I don't know if this is probably like way left field for you guys, but she was on Gilmore Girls too. She was Rory Gilmore's college oh, yeah. friend, so I was familiar with her acting. I thought, oh, she's a good actress, and I love David Tennant. I was looking forward to that. But then as they dug into this, I I'm okay with the darker tone. For instance, I really do like Daredevil and that sort of thing. Like Bryce was mentioning earlier, if you if you like one, you might you know not like the other, vice versa. I feel like Daredevil almost has more of a transformative quality to it than this does so far. And maybe that's going to be part of her journey. But if you look at the monomyth, you know, the, the struggle and the victory and then the growth of the character, I feel like she just keen at, kind of keeps doing the same thing all the time. Like she doesn't seem to be making any turns. She doesn't seem to be aiming at changing her, the way she handles life or her behavior. And she's kind of just in this rut where she's at and she's fine with that. I don't know. I found it almost like almost kind of depressing. Like I was watching a, a, dramatization of a news show or something, all the stuff she was going through. So I'm not uh, sure. I guess, I guess I'll go next because, uh, I've seen less than you have Tom. <laughs> um, number one, uh, the first thing that, that I noticed was, uh, this is a great 21st century repurposing of all of the old film noir, uh, uh, tropes. You know, uh, this is, this is detective pulp fiction from the 1920s writ large in a 21st century universe. And they nail so much of this, right? Uh, one of the unspoken heroes to me of the realism of this is the fact that when they, when you see her sitting at the desk drinking, number one, you see all the brand names, all the logos. It's an Acer brand laptop. It's wild Turkey, uh, whiskey. It's uh, you see Verizon logos in the background. None of it feels forced. None well, of it feels like it's, they're it's paid Jim for. Beam and wild Turkey and some other brand that I hadn't heard of, but Eileen looked up immediately and found, Oh, that's a real brand. Like that's the other thing is she doesn't care. She doesn't have a brand. It's whatever's in reach. whatever's cheapest at any moment. And that's one of the best parts is that oftentimes there's this weird way we want to wrap up brand names where it's like, well, if they're not paying us to put it in there, we're not going to put it in there. You could tell that they're in a position where they're like, same thing with, with the Apple devices in House of Cards. They use those because that's what a rich white person in Washington, D.C. would have, right? Uh, and and likewise, uh, somebody who's down on her luck would have a cheap Android device phone and she would have exposed wires in the background and she would be, she would, uh, one of my favorite recurring bits is, the, is that door that's missing aligned partly because the door to our studio does the same thing you have to lift it in order to close it um all of those things those little attention to detail made me completely buy this universe and this damaged uh, uh girl um which brings me to the second thing uh christy uh, i can't speak to this because i'm a dude but it seems to me like it was a very conscious decision in this to uh, take advantage of the fact that we have a female protagonist and we have the opportunity to tell a story that would resonate. I, I, I don't know if it's sexist to say resonate with females or what, but it's clear that the her entire story is an allegory to a woman who has been raped and to a woman who has escaped a abusive relationship. And 
who is going through. I loved the way right from the first episode, they set up the, uh, the, the ways of coping with PTSD. And I loved the color cues to indicate like, this is when she's getting that oogie feeling of that bad relationship with that person where she did unspeakable things. Um, like was, was all of that worn too much on its sleeve for you? Or did you feel like it was balanced or what was it? What was it like as a female watching it? Um, actually, I mean, I did feel like some of it was over the top. I feel like maybe she chose kind of too dark of a road to walk down. I'm, you know, and obviously I've seen one episode. I don't know everything that's happened. I don't know her entire backstory, but it seems like right off the bat, they kind of intentionally painted her as a damaged character, but more than that, a damaged character who wasn't interested yet in redeeming herself. And I, I almost found that, like, I was wondering what I'm going to be rooting for with this character. Like, what am I cheering for? What am I, you know, you always want to be, like, kind of on the character's side, especially the main character of a show. And for her, I don't know what's what she's showing me that's redeemable about her. Nothing yet. So I kind of adored how long they wait to give you anything redeeming about her or any of her friends. I kind of, and I feel like it was a smart decision. Um, in, a, in a world where DC said they can't, do Wonder Woman as a movie because it's not believable. I think Marvel has found a wonderful way to take, you know, what this might have well have been Wonder Woman in some kind of alternate uh, uh, take on on the story. Um, this could have all looked really cheesy, but by wrapping it up in some really dark conflicts and some damaged characters, it's made it very, very engaging. Um, now, now we're into spo spoiler territory. So if you want to mute, you can, Christy. Uh, Tom. Yes. What did you think of, because I, I didn't see it coming, and it wasn't until the second or third episode when she casually calls somebody Luke that I pieced together who this guy is and what's happening with the bar across the street. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I, uh, as soon as she said Luke, I realized that that was Luke Cage because uh, that that had been in the announcement is that Luke would be in Jessica Jones and then he would have his own story. And then I hope this isn't a spoiler for anyone, but they're going to do a thing with all of them together called the defenders where they, they tie all, all three of these series together. So I was just excited once I figured out like, Oh, that's going to be Luke Cage. That's awesome. Uh, and what I didn't see coming, and maybe this is cause I'm unfamiliar with the comics at all. And I haven't looked into either one of these, uh, stories is what their relationship to each other would be. Yeah, no, I, I'm the same way. I intentionally, you know, I, I, when I saw the announcements about Jessica Jones, I was like, that's a character I don't know much about. And for the first time I was like, I don't want to know much about it. Yeah. I had the same kind of situation with guardians of the galaxy. I was like, Oh, let me save it and I'll get to experience it with the movie or the television show and get to go from there. Um, yeah, they don't even call him Luke until the second episode. And when they do, it was like, oh, of course. Yes, I remember reading about this. And and yeah, so I had the same reaction. Unfortunately, I, I, and again, uh, you know, he sort of fades out after the first three episodes and is not really there in the fourth. I don't know if he comes back. I assume he does. Um but but knowing that uh, knowing that there's a tie-in for everything makes me afraid at this point, four episodes in, that they're only doing fan service or setting up like he's just there long enough to establish his space and then vanish. Um, uh, and, well, and, and knowing that he's going to have his own series, you kind I was kind of okay, like yeah, put him to the side and only use him when we really need him because I want to focus on Jessica and I want to see what she's doing. So visuals are gorgeous. It's got a quirky, uh, cinematography style, uh, which I liked a lot. Uh, the story slow, slower than I would have expected four episodes in it's very leisurely, but then again, um, I, I don't know if that's part of the way they're telling well, this a is, very this is a relationship story. drama. Yeah. Daredevil was, was a guy with an ax to grind. He had to be out on the street fighting all the time. Jessica is trying to get over an abusive relationship. So this is, this is the pace of that kind of drama. And I think that could be a weakness. I don't think it ends up being a weakness, but it is also a great strength that they're not telling superhero stories with either one of these so far. They're telling human stories with people who happen to have powers. To the point that they refuse to even use the names of the other characters, which they have the license to in the Marvel Universe. They go out of their I way mean, to I avoid I saying. I debated that, and she's like, you know, it would almost take you out of the story 
if they started saying the Hulk and Captain oh, America? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, I guarantee you that's why they did that, because you should be able to sit down. And again, this is the way all the comic books are written. They're written as though the, the, the entire rest of the universe doesn't need to exist. It does exist, but right. you can read this comic book and not know about the outside universe and miss nothing in the stories they're trying to tell. Yeah, you want to have the events of New York be a thing that they can react to having had happened, but it shouldn't be essential. It should be easy enough for you to go, oh, well, that's a fictionalized version of a tragedy without having ever seen the Avengers. But if you've seen the Avengers, you're like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, this is how other people reacted to what happened that day. I did like the minor plot thread of somebody being so angry about, as they're saying in the chat room, uh, oh, it's Neshkom is calling it Avengers 11, uh, oh, okay. when when, uh, when a building collapsed on someone and they blame the heroes, you know, saying, oh, you think you saved the day Well, my grandmother died or my mother died or whatever. Um, that kind of anger makes sense to me. Uh, re real quick, can we, can we talk about the acting in this? Um Jessica Jones, I give a 50-50. Half the time, I'm really buying her angst and anger and confusion. The other time, I'm feeling like I'm just not, I'm just not believing it. Luke Cage is fantastic. Every second he's on there, I believe him. David Tennant ruins the show because he reminds everyone what real acting looks like. And compared to David Tennant, uh, 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 Trish talk and uh, and and... And uh, uh, Boner McChokey Pants, uh, uh, the, uh, the the sergeant, you know, I'm killing you now, I'm having sex with you. Uh, uh, they all look like CW, it looks like the Flash. With every moment, the, the three of them are on screen together. Uh, and, and, I, and I mean that with all loving, you know, I love what I saw of the Flash, but it looks like a, a campy Buffy the Vampire Slayer kind of level of acting, which is like some of the actors are just on a different level. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right fair enough <laughs> that, that's what you think that's fine uh i, I didn't that does not my reaction but i also don't have enough passion about it to care to, to <laughs> ch i don't know yeah like i thought Kristen ritter was great actually I, I disagree with you there uh i wasn't as impressed with luke cage as you were but also didn't even think about it so he did a fine job I 100% agree with you on David Tennant and hesitate to say anything more because there's more to come from David Tennant. Uh, and uh, the others didn't bother me. I did not get a CW feel to that. I also love The Flash, too, and, and all of that. So, yeah. Well, and, and didn't, again. Didn't, didn't stick out to me. Yeah, yeah it's just one of the, it, it, again, yeah, my guess is someone either noticed it or they didn't. And that's fine if you think I'm wrong. Um, but, but it did kind of stand out. It's like, what are we going to do? We're going to do this. That's what we're going to do. You know, it, it whatever. Um, uh, overall I'm, I'm enjoying it and I'm certainly all in Bonnie and I are really enjoying watching it together. Uh, man, what a different energy from daredevil. I mean, I, I'm really surprised how they managed to tell in the exact same neighborhood, uh, with its sodium mark yellow lamps that pervade, <laughs> apparently Hell's Kitchen is made of yellow. Uh, <laughs> it, it They're able to tell such a fundamentally different story. And by the way, am I the only one who didn't realize how much Carrie Ann Moss looks exactly like Robin Wright? No. Yes! Oh my God! Yes! yes! <laughs> I kept, the first episode, I kept thinking like, wow, that girl looks a lot like Robin Wright. That, I mean, she's really got a Robin Wright feel. And then it sunk in like, Oh, that's Carrie Emma. She, she even does the same because she has the same haircut as Robin Wright yeah, in yeah. the House of Cards. She did the same kind of cold, you know, fixing the part in her hair thing. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I'm glad you said that because I, I said that to Eileen and she's like, oh, I guess so. And I was like, yeah, no, totally got that vibe. Interesting. Uh, all right. Well, real quickly, let's uh, let's talk about Fargo uh, season six, or season six, season two, episode six. By the way, Fargo got renewed for a third season. I don't know that we know anything uh, substantive about what that season will be, but there there will be another season. Uh, and this episode has Brillig and the Slightly Toads in it. Brian? Dude. Uh, Christy, are you watching Fargo by any chance? I'm not, no. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, spoilers listen, incoming, though. gotta warn you. Um, <laughs> that's another thing. You want to talk about uh, acting at another level. I mean... Watch any just this said with all love for Jessica Jones, but watch any episode of that and then watch Fargo and you'll see what real acting is made of. Man, that stuff is chilling and haunting uh, is it's amazing. You know, 
uh, I, I don't even know what to say. That that moment, that opening, that cold opening where uh, uh, where where um, uh, the brother uh, starts starts beating up on Dodd, and then uh, and then that exchange where Dodd's like. Yeah, so anyway, now's the part where I gotta whip you, I gotta give you the belt. I mean, I can't have the men see you treat me you like that. You can have the strap or the belt. And 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 just with looking him in the eyes, like, you give me the belt, you son of a bitch. And then uh and it's like I expected the to see I'm it. Sorry, the strap the or buckle. the buckle. Yeah, the buckle. Oh my god. So good. Everybody, everybody was so good. And I can't believe the superstar of it was the drunk lawyer. That drunk lawyer I bought every second of. Oh, you're 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 talking about uh, Offerman, Nick Offerman. Yes, yes. Yeah, he he was a bit of a caricature in the previous episodes, which I was like, ah, he's Nick Offerman. It's great to see him. That's fine. By the way, that's uh, a great name for this, a lawyer. But, uh, allow me to make one more. Him. This turned him into a real character, where his previous caricatureness now feels like that guy who acts like a caricature of himself sometimes. Especially with. Uh, because he came out on top, right? The, the the fact that he delivered the goods, the fact that he went out into a no win scenario, into a Kobayashi Maru, and just sort of negotiates and and speaks with utter confidence well, and, and power. You know, as drunk and as bombastic as that guy is, that's the only way he gets by in life is by being able to do what he did there. Yeah, dude. Uh, the um, uh, yeah. It it uh, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me a little bit of of the character as he's represented in the master of uh, uh, you know when um, Philip Seymour Hoffman is portraying a fictionalized version of uh, uh, Scientology. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, founder of Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard. Like I like like that kind of that kind of like uh, you know just just spinning a, a tail wherever he walks. You know, uh, pulled out of the ether. I, I totally believed all of it. It was so great. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, we are both fans of Mike Milligan, obviously. Uh, I uh, was blown away by the, you, you need to call me. Okay, I'm calling you. This is what's happening. You're like, oh, well, they're going to they're gonna head down there and confront those guys in the town. Not oh, his no, plan. I'm not evil enough. Those guys are evil. That's what evil people do. They're like, oh, all the defenders are gone? Awesome. Cold-blooded. Cold-blooded, calculating sociopath Mike Milligan, my new favorite character in the entire series. I, all right, if you had to pick between Mike Milligan and Billy Bob Thornton's character in the first season, who would it be? That oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, right. That is a tough one because Billy Bob Thornton's character was so well played, well well honed, uh, but Milligan's cheeriness just makes him extra creepy. Uh, and what's funny is you know that that actor was handed the script in which Mike Milligan recites the Jabberwocky, and he went a very different direction than I would think. He didn't make it dark and foreboding and, and intimidating. He 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 told it like a nursery rhyme, like he was yeah. speaking to children, and we were the children. And I loved – I again, there are times that the 70s style split screen and the cuts and the suddenly going to film grain or all that, sometimes I feel – you know, sometimes it feels heavy-handed to me, but – when the spell is weaved correctly, I get swept in all the way, and that definitely was the case this episode. Yeah, Bokeem Woodbine is the guy who plays Mike Milligan. We should get him on the uh, show. And we, we, should, we should. Let's find out his Twitter. Tell, yeah. tell him he's got fans here. Bokeem, uh, what was his name? Bokeem Woodbine. Uh, we need to learn that name because it's worth learning. Because uh, yeah, you're right. Like He took what could have just been – a weird section or a fairy tale section or a, a or a, a juxtaposition of uh, of of the you know lighthearted words and and he just he just made it evil it was the evilest brillig in the slightly toad that ever gyred and gimbled in any way <laughs> <laughs> uh dude well they continue to kill it i'm really surprised uh the first episode i was i took a step back i was really worried that it was going to be too much and and i still maintain there was elements of the first episode that didn't need to be the, be there but hopefully i'll be wrong by the time i watch this thing all i know is i'm a hundred percent all in on this how great was it by the way when uh Salverson was bringing in um uh, i keep wanting to call him todd uh and there's that brief moment that he speaks to the the dower girl from the butcher shop and then just like a switch is flipped Salverson's like shut up you know it's like he, he can't have a suspect talk to uh another random person colluding on their story in front of him uh yeah. it was great it was great yeah. Well, and it's the kind of thing where you're like, oh, that's that guy doing his job, not that guy being nice to his wife. Like the fact that that guy is is a good father when he's at home doesn't mean he can't be a hard ass and do his job. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, that is it for spoiler in time. Thanks again, Christy Cates, for hanging out with us. 
Thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. ChristyCates.com. Two Ks. Christy Cates. <laughs> That's K. Christy Two Ks, K. just not together. Cates with a, K, with a K and com with a C. So you can go back to yes. a C once you get to the dot com. ChristyCates.com. Exactly. Thanks, everybody. We'll spoil you next time. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>